Um, I lead a master's program in media industries, and my research is quite broad across media industries, media policy, and so on. I've also had a long background in media campaigning and advocacy on behalf of media democracy, pluralism, and human rights, and certainly including <coughs> human rights as part of that work. My particular specialism at the moment, and one reason I'm here on a panel with Patricia, is I research branded content. I research the intersection and integration of media and advertising, largely from a critical perspective um, about those changes. So um, one of the things I'm doing is um, editing a special issue of the journal Digital Journalism on sponsored editorial content, advertorials in news. Um, and I edit a book series for Routledge called Critical Advertising Studies, which publishes short-form books from young, early careers, researchers, as well as distinguished academics. So if anyone is interested in those areas, please get in touch. But let me please introduce what the panel offers you today. The title of this panel is Children, Youth, and Smart Screen Media, Changing Habits and Detecting Risks and Opportunities. And we have four speakers for you. So with your permission, I'm going to divide the session up so that at first we hear from people who are interested in producing or researching the production and consumption of children's media. Okay? So the first part is about research, practice, and understanding of the changing world of children's media. And then the second part will open up into those questions in particular of opportunity and risk. So we have a broad agenda, and I want to signal now, after the first two speakers, I want to allow some time for us to discuss those first issues. So those of you who are particularly interested as researchers in understanding um, the changing nature of children's media, and then we'll go on to questions of um, production. But uh, if there is a way of binding these together, um, perhaps there's a central question for us all in this session and for the conference. How can children's rights be advanced and protected? How can we ensure that the digital and networked media promote and protect rather than undermine children's <coughs> rights? If those are central questions, they're clearly salient to understanding the changing nature of provision for children, children's consumption and use, and the questions of policy, moderation, and governance that we'll look at in the second part. So that's the plan. Um, and to begin, I'm going to introduce the coordinator of this wonderful conference, Felix, to discuss his research on children's media consumption. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so see the difference in Spain of the individuals, the groups in Andalusia, whereas Catalonia and Madrid. We have done this for the television consumption, for the public service broadcasting. Peter Lund was moderating a panel in the in the IMCR conference in Madrid, and we presented some results that we will, we will, we have been working with Anna from Mendes team and my team. Anna is not here, but well, she's in the conference on television. But we wanted to to focus, focus, uh, to focus sorry. Um, on some questions, but addressed to, the, to children, youth, and media. These are also some of the research questions that we are willing to, to answer, or to find out that we are actually uh, fostering. What are the wishes and demands of the children? How will they take and analyze all your network stream use? Some questions and hypothetical, hypothetical analysis that has been fostered <coughs> within the network and within the research groups that are present here. Of course, in the, in the different r results and research that are being done and are, are being promoted. So, what have we done? Where is the data? I'm not going to present any results because I couldn't manage. We have the graph, we have some of the analysis, you will have the paper probably. We don't know in what, and it will be presented, and you will have access, and I, 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 you have the guarantee that we will, once we publish the first few things, you will have access to the full data. Just for being in the crowd, for being here, we will send, it will be open access in the web pages, but we'll, we'll send you the data that comes from this pilot study, from the other one, so that you can use it. Brilliant. So we have data through a portrait sample. Portrait is a, is a software for research and also for, for other things that enables us to have access to panels, paid panels, we pay portraits for the company, 
to guarantee quality and random selection of individuals that do within a with a control a scenario and pattern timing that they that they do it properly that it, they do it at the right time. We select the quality of the responses. Okay, uh, of course. That children of seven, eight, and years of age with the consent, the explicit consent of the tutor or parent. Okay? So we have this, 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 this data, and I think what, what was what was particular from there. What is relevant, or what, or what was relevant, is that we went first. So we, we, we got some research money together with Patricia, and we want to have a thousand. We could have, we didn't have the time for a thousand, the money, not the time. For so we got for five hundred. At the end, we had. Responses for 528 children. We have to select a little bit to do some quality in analysis of those ones. It will be maybe 510, and then analyze the data. The good thing of course is that we can of course export it and analyze within our team with the statisticians and the analysis and the contents of the variables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we have also some within the platform. We have also statistical analysis, and we can we can select variables. For example, uh, children, uh, not children. Uh, um, male and female confrontation, regional confrontation within the platform and, and the group of research. So the survey was done in August, this, uh, this August. <laughs> it finished, I think, on the 31 because we it took about four weeks. The last, the last week always takes a little bit longer because we, we, we told questions. We need these individuals from Comunidad de Madrid in this age group, and they had to be proportional. Men and women, so the last individuals that come into the survey that was a bit less. This is the, the barometer. We selected in, in cities of above 10,000 inhabitants for statistically, we could go for the rural population too. We had the, top, the money, but we wanted to go to the urban, okay? Of course. Spain, as a European, uh, and not European, yes, a European, it is a European country, of course, um, uh, has some rural population, but diminishing, okay? So the, the, I think about 95% of the population lives in, 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 in cities of above 10,000 inhabitants, I think, so we'll have to check that. But normally, all the research has been done in, on surveys in, in audiences in Spain, also in Europe, is done in cities above 10,000 inhabitants. So we, we selected that. We, our target was 1,000 individuals, but we only got the funding for half of the sample, so we said, okay, we'll go for the 500. With that, it was it was the, the survey in, in the other age groups is going to be partially adapted to the linguistic of the children, of course, the questions and the mode. For example, we copied one of the ideas that Sonia has done in many ideas of Sonia and the team from Christina and others. But for example, in Madrid, we got that idea very interesting that Christina presented about the ladder, the ladder of income. So we adapted that one, we did it shorter, and we have ladder of income perceived level of income by a child of seven, eight, and nine. Oh, they, they did respond to that. It, it was more, more visual, they touched it in the tablet. I will show it to you, if you um, but when the results come. So the, the survey took about uh, 12 minutes. We got, I think, good questions. We have good data, I'm not presenting it today. But we have, in the conclusions, and in, in this eight, 10 minute presentation, we have uh, the project of having a Spain barometer, that we call it a barometer, it will be a joint action by Madrid and Salamanca, led together. And we have also we have also proposed it from some funding. This month we will have we will have some answers, or we have some funding, maybe the television people is giving us some money, or <laughs> so we are just marketing what we're working in. But, uh, uh, Patricia, is, is she's got the connections. <laughs> we have the connections. I think we're going to have the, the money from one place or the other for the for the barometer in Spain. And then we'll, we'll, we're willing to go into the also in the other side in, in our team. As I talked with David Smau, who's, who has a wonderful project I wasn't very acquainted with that he's going to present. We have also in our team in Salamanca, we have data dealer and statisticians and a master in data analysis. So we're also working on auto, uh, natural language processing tools and supercomputing association with the supercomputer in Castilla Leon, it's called Skyle. So we're doing also some uh, uh, automatic analysis and linguistic analysis that we, we may also connect to the analysis of, of this survey as a second methodology. I'm not saying complementary, but with a second view. And David is going to present something that I think is very interesting for a future European project. Uh, project. And I told him 
We may like to participate. We, we have presented in this barometer also that network analysis because we do natural language processing tools uh, in Twitter for hate speech. <coughs> we have two projects on that. One European that we, <coughs> we didn't let, that was Carlos Alcida, I mean the team. Uh, well, if you're interested on in those issues, write to me and we, we may be working on, on those areas. Fine. So, the conclusion. So, I don't present any results, but we have the results. So, if someone is very interested, I, I could send him or her the results with the confidentiality that we haven't yet published anything. So, yeah. you have access to that, but let us publish first, and then you can avoid it. Guarantee. Total trust. And even if you have if you have a portrait user, I could even share the project if you like. But if anyone at the university is working with Quartz as a platform, I could share the project on the data. So what is, is our proposal? Is this, this EU CAT set? I think we, we are finally on that scenario that we're going to get the funding and the right things for Spain and then go into the European level. But we are proposing what we call an EU CAT parameter with the remain Brexit test that are not going to Brexit. So the UK and the Anglo-Saxon sphere is going to be there. We're going to target English, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish as languages. I didn't place there the, the, the countries because uh, they are not yet placed, but of course it will be probably England, of course Fr France, probably with Belgium sign. We're not going to the Flemish, Germany, or I know probably Austria. So it depends on the different partners. We have some connections within ECREA, of course, but also the European Broadcasting Union that probably will have with some mediation or the connections in the network for presenting this as a European project in the future. And with the inclusion of that part too, an analysis of the string of use, probably on, on, on the race, on the hate speech against children or within the children or with that, that research result that which many researchers have uh, indicated. And we have also information with our survey and the research that we have been uh, studying that says that children in those young ages are in social networks with all the risks, but with the fraud, parental fraud of inventing their age. So we want to detect from one side or the other and complement because we have the, the, the opportunity, the survey methodology and other methodologies with this one in the natural language capture analysis and bibliography and Thanks for your attention. I was on time, wasn't I? Fantastic. Wonderful. Soy Verónica Pastrana. Eh, yo soy productora y eh, directora de, especializada en televisión infantil. Eh, con más de, no sé, 15 años de experiencia. I'm a producer specializing in production for youth television. Sí. Um, y además soy fundadora de Yer Kids Media. I'm the founder of this portal. Yer uh, Kids Media, os voy a contar lo que hacemos. Yer Kids Media es... En uh, Yer Kids Media calificamos eh, producciones audiovisuales para niños de, de 2 a, a 13 años. Y, y además um, ofrecemos... Eh, nuestra misión es... Um, Para nosotros es muy, muy importante porque hacemos es porque nuestra misión es promover la calidad de la cultura audiovisual uh, para los niños de 2 a 13 años y, 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 y lo que hacemos es que eh, tenemos un, uh, un servicio de calificación que ofrecemos a los video players. Uh, además tenemos esta página web que está al servicio de, de, de las familias. Yes. Yes. We got this web page, we categorize uh, with the movies, with some ratings, and it's at the service of, of course, of the, of the producer, but also the families to get the advice of the categorization of, of the content. Y tenemos nuestro programa de Yep Expertos, que es nuestro programa de alfabetización audiovisual eh, con los niños en las escuelas en, en primaria. So we have the program Yep Expert, that is a program for uh, literacy and alphabetization, I think you said, yeah. for primary school and secondary school. Yes, yes. Eh, nuestro trabajo con con los niños eh, a través de nuestros talleres, nuestros focus group, uh, nuestro trabajo con jurados infantiles nos ha hecho eh, dar el paso de crear una nueva organización que es eh, que son los premios audiovisuales eh, Really for Kids.
So they have a prize ready for kids and they're working in some contests with juries. Is it the yeah. Children doing the, the, jury. the evalu jury, evaluation of content. So now I want to explain okay. this. So, um, Araida nos trabajó con los niños de ella y um, nos hemos dado cuenta que el momento para nosotros adecuado para, para trabajar la alfabetización audiovisual es a partir de 6, 7 años. Es el momento clave en el que nosotros podemos acompañarles y además en el que la, la labor de alfabetización guiada eh, pensamos que, que, que dan grandes frutos. The right time is the age, what was the age? About six years. From six years onwards, to, to, to give the advice and to accompany the children in this process. Yes, so the idea of our work with the children, as I said, is the first prize of audiovisual, Ready for Kids, which are some prizes that are very close to other prizes that already exist, like the work of the jurado infantil, like the work that is done in Cine Kids. ¿no? Eh, que es un festival muy antiguo que hay en Holanda y el trabajo que se hace en, de jurado en Prigenes. So, Primekin and Prigenes, there are some festivals that are, has been an inspiration for these prize festivals where the kids are evaluating and giving ratings sí. to what they're watching. Estos son organizaciones y festivales eh, que nos acompañan y que nos inspiran y que nos van a acompañar en este, en, en este proceso de, de alfabetización, o sea, en este proceso de jurado infantil. Trabajo de jurado infantil, o sea, yo realmente lo que os puedo contar aquí es mi trabajo de campo con, con los niños. El trabajo de jurado infantil para nosotros es muy, es, es muy importante y vamos a hacer unos premios que sucederán en, en, en la escuela uh, y que ofrece la oportunidad a los, a los niños de, de evaluar el ritmo, de, de acompañarles para que y se sitúen, ¿no? para, que, para, para, para que sean críticos con, con, con lo que venía, activos con los medios de so the children intervene and we want them to intervene and evaluate in this context at school so that they are so that they learn to be critical in contextualization of what they are watching and what they are pricing. El, son unos, bueno, realmente es la primera vez que hablo de los premios eh, Ready for Kids, es, que es nuestra organización <coughs> el, eh, centrada en, el, en la alfabetización para niños. Se dan unos premios nacionales para niños de 6 a 12 años, habrá una categoría de 6 a 9 años y otra de 10 a 12. Eh, de ficción y no ficción y, y fiction también, and fiction. habrá un premio al maestro que para nosotros es importante eh, apoyar la figura del maestro eh, y también recoger su opinión sobre las, la calidad de los productos el, el, el premio el premio el premio el premio realmente el premio eh, es, no, el, no, el premio como, como productor es eh, recibir la valoración de los niños como jugador infantil, que es algo que no se hace y, como, ¿no? y tiene mucho que ver con vuestra investigación. Vosotros habéis investigado desde el lado académico cuáles son los hábitos de los niños de 6 a 7, 8 años. Nosotros lo que hacemos y que haremos juntos en, nuestro, en nuestros premios es, 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 algo, es algo parecido, porque nosotros... So the price, the price is a feedback for the producer, what they're producing and what the children are saying, of course. And it's, it's a feedback, but it's also a merit, maybe, for the producer. Or not that. And no, no. No, it's a merit. If the children like it, why not? No, no, no. Pero, pero no, o sea, realmente lo que nosotros hacemos es, y forma parte de nuestra, nuestro ADN, tanto en Deep Kids Media como en Ready for Kids, es um, poner al niño en el centro, mm -hmm. que es nuestra filosofía. Todo se basa en poner al niño en el centro. La filosofía es to place the child at the center, so that the philosophy is that he can handle what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I understand what he's doing in, in the watching and the watching mm -hmm. process. Entonces, en, o sea, lo que realmente en eso se basa todo lo que hacemos en Positive. Entonces, el premio está construido para, para que sea el premio de los niños y que los niños sientan que es su espacio para ver otras producciones que se, que se hacen en otras partes del mundo, de Noruega, de Dinamarca, de Suecia, de Alemania, de, de Latinoamérica, y, y, y les da la, la posibilidad de. de Conocer, conocerse a sí mismos y conocer al otro y, 
y posicionarse de una forma activa y crítica en los medios de comunicación, que es nuestra sure. misión y nuestro objetivo. This is an inspiration that comes from Denmark and, and other countries, and it's an inspiration that has, has not been done yet in Spain. So our objective is to follow that lead and, and give inspiration and some audience authority to the children. Yes, yes, this is, this is the thing. Uh, y esto es, uh, bueno, um, ¿qué más puedo contar? Eh, bueno, es para nosotros es, un, es muy importante, los premios eh, son realmente un instrumento que nos apasiona y, 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 es, y creo, creemos que es muy importante porque, como te digo, para nosotros todo lo que hacemos eh, eh, ponemos al niño en el centro, desde cuando producimos, si producimos un programa de televisión, el niño está con nosotros desde la preproducción hasta la producción, hasta la postproducción. Y creamos con ellos en el centro, desde cómo se hace un guión hasta cómo se pone la cámara eh, y cómo se construye una narrativa audiovisual. Todo está, todo el rato, construido o no, y con el placing the, the child at the center in order to pre-produce, produce, and then probably distribute to a certain extent products not only that are produced in the, in the Spanish uh, sort of production structure, you, told, you also saw about from some international content, mm -hmm. uh, Anglo-Saxon or English, I say there. No, so, and, and that's probably the, 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 revo the revolutionary idea is to play the child in terms of the decision making. Yeah. Value chain, maybe. Okay, pero, no, esto no es una idea revolucionaria. O sea, esto es una... But for Spain it is. Because it has, Spain, it has not been done before. Okay, okay. <laughs> for Spain it is. But yo pertenezco a una red internacional uh, procedente de Prigenes, que es un festival de, de contenidos audiovisuales de calidad, que es como el caso de la televisión fácil. Y en esta red internacional de expertos en contenidos audiovisuales infantiles, lo que nos mueve y lo que nos une a toda la red internacional es la de construir televisión de calidad para los niños, con el niño en el centro. O sea, que lo que yo he aprendido y mi formación es Prigeness. So the Prigeness Network, the European Network, we replace the kid at the center like Prigeness uh, Associated do, and we want to foster that, that line and, and do something that is For Spain, revolutionary. I'm not acquainted. It has not been done yet. No. Y bueno, desde hace 15 minutos. Sí, no, 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 no. Las, no, no, no. Un tema de palabras, sí, sí. Y, y nada, gracias a Patricia Félix por, por, por dejarnos este espacio para compartir un poquito lo que, lo que hago que, que, que realmente me apasiona. Y, y mi objetivo es un Thanks for these 10 minutes. I want to present what we're doing from the industry to certain con content in this panel and uh, show what, what are the, the leading leads that we're fostering in the, in the, in the Spanish sphere, so to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to speak about the project we just started this year, so uh, it is not finished and it is a five years project, so we are actually on the beginning. I hope you will find it interesting uh, in relation to methodologies which we use uh, to uh, identify online risks for children and adolescents. I hope uh, something what is uh, related to this session. Just a little bit, this is maybe first to say this is a project of uh, basic research, uh, not applied yet, and this is a theoretical model which we are using. Uh, just uh, very shortly, not to waste too much time on that. Uh, the output for us is well-being, psychological, social and physical well-being. And we, we are trying to study what variables on the individual levels, psychosocial, social level, peers, family, educator, community and country level are impa impacting the technology usage and how is the technology usage impacting the well-being and from different point of views such as short-term effects which are just like after uh, like like I feel after I use uh, messenger with my friend or stranger or anything and in long term uh, what what this communication is what is the impact of this communication in long term perspective uh, so this is just simply said Uh, this project has actually five work packages, so it is quite a big project. 
The first one is on analysis of uh, current data, especially data of EU Online 2018. The second one is a longitudinal study with three waves in uh, two years, with uh, two th at least 2,000 children in the first wave. Uh, so we will follow same fa families in a three-wave study. The third one is on short-term impacts of technology on well-being, where we use innovative techniques as eye trackers in experimental studies. And the fourth one, which I will speak about now, is uh, about interconnection of short-term and long-term impacts. And it is actually about developing of new research tools. And this is the goal of my presentation. And fifth work package is a theoretical integration. So now I will speak only about the work package four, which is, I believe, kind of innovative. Um, and this is something that the research <coughs> might go for the future. So the goal of this work package is a development of a software which will detect, automatically detect in mobile phones what are children doing, what are their activities, and uh, uh, what are risks and opportunities for them. Uh, the software will be able to generate short questionnaires which should be, for the future, connected to the actual activity of children. That means that the software will, for example, recognize cyberbullying or, uh, let's say, some kind of opportunity or, or meeting strangers and can ask after that what was happening. Uh, this automatic detection is based on machine learning techniques, this application of artificial intelligence, that learn from patterns of identification of data and the software could be able also to identify kind of abnormal behavior of children in relation to their normal behavior. Uh, this, this work is inspired by so-called green methods, dynamic real-time ecological ambulatory methodologies, which are used especially in the health-related research. And uh, if you want to know more, look at uh, Google Penn State University and uh, Dream Methods. Actually, we have a colleague who came from Penn State to Masaryk University who is expert on that. And I'm Sterian Elavsky and I'm very happy to work with her on that. And this is, uh, this is how we proceed. It's very complicated from the ethical and law perspective, as you can imagine. So the goal of the first year, what is uh, what we are working right now is to receive, uh, uh, to we, we have also a lawyer in the team and we have uh, regular meetings with the lawyer and speaking how can we do it from the law perspective because as you can imagine it's impossible to analyze data especially of third parties which are in mobile phones. This is kind of a big problem because children and parents agree you have concept for the child but you don't have agreement of third parties, which are in mobile phones also, such as on Facebook. Uh, that's why we work also on the anonymization software, on this kind of software which will do these uh, photos and also texts anonymize, almost 100% anonymization. That means that all the names and all the kind of identification which you might get from the mobile phone will be anonymized automatically. Uh, then from the second year, from the next year, we start to prepare the machine learning. I will talk a little bit more about this later. And the main study, uh, I will explain also later how, how, it, how, how we will proceed with the main study, which will start actually from the third year. The team is quite big. This project is also quite big and complicated, as you can imagine. There are five researchers from social science, expert on three methods, two researchers from computer, computer science, software developer, expert on this data analysis because this data will be super huge and also advisor in machine learning. The whole project is almost two million euros and this is about half of the project, so it's kind of huge. Uh, so this is how we will do the, this is where we go to the third year, what will be the main study. Uh, we will proceed the data collection uh, with uh, 200 adolescents in the time period of one year. 
with a survey on the beginning, survey in the end. These are these long-term effects of the technology usage and so-called boost data collections in between. We always collect data in two weeks, data collections uh, in four bursts. And this automatic data collection will be, data will be collected from this application, which will automatically collect data from mobile phones. I will show you later what will be collected. And this will be supplemented by the short surveys, which will children receive every day. Morning, evening, probably, and something in the middle, depending on the activity of the child. So we will record the screen, do automatic processing of the screens by machine learning, and give them these short surveys. <coughs> so this is just to give you some feeling how it looks like. We have first version of the application, but there is also this complicated server side, as you can imagine. So this is the app on the left side. Uh, this is how, the, how you enter the survey. You can postpone the survey also to the later time. Uh, it's good that the, it is also complicated and it's good we have this expert from coming from Penn State. This is just the, see very simply how the questionnaire, the survey looks like, uh, which, which they will receive every, every day. Uh, you can also, in the survey, you can also record voice if you like, or make, let, ask them to make a picture, so this also could be something innovative to include this kind of live data from what they are doing. We are not sure if we use this. We also made a literature review. Natalia, who is also here, was working on this actually. We found about 40 articles on detection of online risks. Uh, I have not so much time, three minutes only. I, I, I'm coming to most complicated parts. <laughs> this, is, this is only, this is only uh, what we will code for the machine learning, only just to get feeling. It's also, it's not done, it's just the draft. And this is, this is coming to be complicated. Uh, this is uh, a picture how, how this whole thing will work from the technical perspective. On the left side, there is the mobile phone of children. So we will have their questionnaires, but also data from sensors, such as GPS, Wi-Fi, uh, screen state, off or on. Also, what they are doing on, from the screen. Also, accelerometer, what is especially important for the physical well-being, how they are moving or not moving, sport activities, which are automatically detected from the mobile phone, uh, light sensor also, uh, then application data, and then text data and screenshots. So all this information will be automatically proceeds in, with some software. Then there is the server side. What is maybe most important to say, we will divide the information from the screen to photos and to texts. Uh, there is there is software which can do it. Uh, the photos, we are unable to develop our own machine learning for photos because it's a super complicated task for a new big project and there are several teams working on it. And photos will be uh, divide it in some way and we will use external services to uh, give us information what is on the photos. You can buy it, for example, from Google or Amazon or other services which already developed this complicated machine learning on uh, photos. Uh, and then we will develop our own machine learning on texts which uh, children have. Uh, so that means that we must do some kind of coding for being able to identify these risks and opportunities and uh, according certain coding scheme which we are developing right now. Uh, computer science guys call this annotation, annotation of data. Actually, it's kind of content analysis. Uh, yes. Maybe you can ask also what is future of this project. We are just now we are working on the application and the server and the ethical part, and now maybe we uh, try to connect to the industry. So what is future of the future? Uh, we can think about more applied usage of this application. Now it is for me this project is only basic research, as I said, but uh, we can. We can use this application also more for industry and for parents and children. So we will probably ask for another project from applied agency for research. 
uh, which could develop a software for parents and children. And my basic idea behind is that the current software for parents is based only on monitoring and restriction. If you download the software, it will only say you how much time can a child use on the internet and when uh, the child should stop using it and so on. But the new software should be able to teach parents and children based on that what are children doing. So the software should be able to get adapted to the age of the children and adapt it to their current activities and level of uh, digital skills, let's say, and teach them how to use the internet in the uh, safe way. What is the future of the future, let's say. <laughs> yes. So, to, summar to summarize, we are in the beginning, but the goal, the future goal, is to be able to provide automatic active mediation for children, provided particularly by the software itself. And the software could also encourage the communication between parents and children. What is, I believe, something new. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. Um, just a really interesting presentation. I don't think mine will be anything like as good as that, but um, who knows. Um, my name is Julian Coles. Um, I am the policy lead for an organization called the Internet Commission. The Internet Commission, most of you won't have heard of, but uh, it is a non-profit startup based in London, looking outwards with an international focus, and we've been going 18 months, so we're the Internet Commission. Um, and our mission is to uh, advance digital responsibility through independent evaluation. I'll illustrate that for a moment. I want to briefly cover risks, regulation, and independent evaluation in this short talk. Risk online content risks, regulation, the prospect of new regulations and new regulators in this area at national and international level, and an independent uh, evaluation about how this may be able to help us. There's a lot in this slide. Um, this is what the European Commission call the beautiful flower, which is very kind of them indeed, but they've called it the beautiful flower, so that's what we call it. Um, it's our accountability model for digital responsibility. If you, if you want to take it at its simplest, it is a very high level view of what good looks like in, the, in these particular areas. You've got digital responsibility, different areas, what would good look like in each individual area. And our first project takes the, uh, the issues on the right, a series of issues on the right, and looks at the risks and then uh, comparing what risks we find with how far companies have got to get into what good looks like. So how far away are they, how close are they? Are they? But this, is, this, if you like, is a good a kind of synthesis of the goal for where we're trying to drive. If you take the right-hand side, you can see respect at the top right. So we're interested in lack of respect, and one example might be hate speech. And then, uh, what would good look like here? Well, offensive and harmful content is contained without compromising free speech. So that would be a good outcome. Safety and security, a key risk might be cyberbullying, data ethics, bias in training data, truth would be disinformation and well-being. An absence of well-being, an example might be the prevalence of pro-anorexia uh, or pro-bulimia sites. The scope of our project, we're, we're looking at children, young people and adults, but if you look at all those issues on the right, you can see they're all really relevant to children and young people. And then we narrow our focus down to say, within this area, we, the Internet Commission, are looking at how Internet companies manage content on their platforms. 
moderation at scale and governance. Um, in the meantime, while we've been developing our project and our platform, um, a lot's been happening across Europe in the regulatory area. So you've got momentum building across Europe for platforms uh, for wide-ranging internet regulation. Uh, in the UK, we've got the online halfway paper. There's a new statutory duty of care for platforms to act against a wide range of harmful and illegal content. Uh, it's expected to come into force by about 2022. We don't know how this will work out. Politics in Britain is rather unstable at the moment and hard to predict. Um, these proposals mix uh, what you could call a flexible duty of care with prescriptive codes of conduct. These prescriptive codes of conduct may not be future-proof, so there are some problems. Then you've got French proposals. Um, Emmanuel Macron um, met Mark Zuckerberg, and French officials went in to see how, how Facebook were moderating in January and February this year, <clears throat> and out of this came French proposals to target companies that have the greatest digital impact and the highest risk. And then bigger than all that, you've got the Digital Services Act, proposed by the new European Commission to review and clarify the rules around platform liability. Uh, and that could take the whole four-year cycle of the next commission. This is a huge project. And finally, and in a completely different state, you've got the revised AVMS directive, which is basically baked and cooked and ready to go, extending scope to video sharing platforms. That will be implemented at national level in September 2020. One issue around AVMS, the scope is still not entirely clear. What do we mean by principal purpose? Well, YouTube are obviously included. Facebook are probably included. Twitter may not be included. And WhatsApp probably aren't included. So there's a whole set of issues to unpack there. We think that this uh, momentum for legislation creates new opportunities for independent evaluation of what these companies are doing. Because the implementation, the legal implementation, could take three or four years. The details of the new laws are still to be agreed. So we think there are opportunities now uh, to, to take advantage of this. For companies to be able to check their performance before they come into a greater legislative scrutiny, which is coming down the tracks, and not just in, in a whole range of different nations. The, the Irish are doing it, uh, lots of other people are working on this. And then generally, for us as a whole, to tackle extreme asymmetries of information between platforms, policymakers, and civil society. We like to think when we make policy that first we get the evidence, and then we make the policy. If we're not careful, We'll be getting the evidence at the same time as we're making the policy. That's a danger with the online harms white paper, and that does not make for good regulation. And then finally, we think there are, for, if there's an opportunity here for companies to demonstrate more accountability over how they make decisions about content they moderate. And one way of do, doing that is by using our framework. So, a little bit more about our first project. Our first project is the evaluation framework for content moderation. It focuses on moderation of governments. We look at how the platforms manage content, contact, and conduct. We use qualitative and quantitative indicators. Uh, we're at least as interested in procedural accountability as in specific measuring specific outcomes. The, the framework does both, but how people are doing it, how, how are you moderate? How, how exactly do you do this? You're not telling us much, yet it's affecting everyone around the world all the time. Um, we are crucially independent of government and industry, and we're offering, as I said earlier, an international perspective. Um, we've had an awful lot of help. We've had help from industry, from NGOs, from experts, including Sonia Livingston herself. Uh, from John Carr, Professor Brian O'Neill, Dublin Technological University, and we've had help from the regulators, so help from the British Department of Culture, but even more so from the Australian E-Safety Commissioner, Julie Immigrant, who is ex-industry, 
from DG Connect, Prabhat Agarwal, who looks after um, uh, platform accountability. And they've both been extremely supportive and encouraging, which has been very helpful. So our framework seeks to establish a set of indicators, um, which give a rounded picture of performance, which reflect on the growing importance of what I'm going to call, for shorthand, artificial intelligence. And we know that in this area, the politicians are saying that soon all harmful content will be stopped before publication. That's not the politicians. If you ask the experts, they're saying AI cannot properly evaluate context yet and won't be able to do for a number of, for a good number of years. So there's a tension there. We are, our indicators also look at the balance between safety and security, privacy and freedom of expression, and we integrate the Santa Clara principles on moderation at scale from last year. Finally, oh yeah, um, and just on the right, just to give you an idea of what our indicators are, what kind of questions are we asking? And this is of all kinds of platforms we moderate at scale. So there might be social media, might be gaming, uh, might be dating platforms, might be publishers, uh, broadcasters, all sorts of people who do this. How is the platform alerted to potential breaches of its rules? So those are human te and technical issues. Moderation. How are decisions made to take action about content? How do you do this stuff? Um, and um, so one issue there is that the uh, human moderation, yes, we all know about that, but how much technical moderation removal is going on without, uh, without any human intervention? And just very quickly to round out on that, we've got notice, process of appeal, resources, and governments. And final slide, where have we got to? So, this is our 2019-20 is roadmap. Don't worry about the details. Just very quickly, in Q3, we're recruiting reporting partner companies that target our five companies. In Q1, we publish the actual framework. In Q, sorry, in Q4 and Q1, we're analyzing the data and creating the first independent report. In Q2, we're publishing that first annual report. Uh, what progress have we made with the companies? Well, the BBC have agreed to participate in our evaluation framework, and they do quite a lot of moderation at scale. We have Oracle joining up as a founding partner. We have a global gaming platform. We're in uh, very advanced discussions with a global dating platform. We're in advanced discussions with and a global education and learning company who we're, we're talking the same. This is all for to get the information on moderation at scale. So I probably will run by that. That's my. Lightning quick, I hope, tour around content regulation and independent evaluation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gabriel Lavi from the University of Seville, and I'm with the Department from Communication Policy. And uh, I would like to ask William, what do you think is the role of the European Union in all of this? I mean, France, England, Spain are working, but do you think that Europe could have an important role in protection of uh, children, or at the end, every country is going to do what they want to do? Well, I think you can already see with the e-commerce directive, sorry, the, uh, the copyright directive, some um, erosion of the general principles, safe harbor principles of the e-commerce directive. And the impression I get is that that framework is going to be very heavily tested by the Digital Services Act. Yeah. I, think, I think there'll be a lot of very tricky thinking. And all these things, all these sort of European initiatives, of which there are many, many voluntary, they all have to be aligned. We have to know which, regu which form of regulation is going to sit. So uh, I, think, I think there are really important things to do at a European level. Uh, and I think there are things to do at a national level because different cultures see things in different ways. And when I used to work in television for the BBC, the European Commission wanted us to sign up to a harmonized set of um, content standards, what was suitable for children across the European Union. 
And a lot of us said, actually, that doesn't work because different countries have different expectations. So I think, but on the other hand, if you're looking at um, economic uh, issues, issues of monopoly power, for example, then I think that's a great area for the European Commission to carry on showing that it is willing to stand up against the biggest social media companies in the world. So just a brief comment that you're invited to share. Um, there's a new organization, I'm from the United States, and there's a new organization in the United States called Scholars and Storytellers, which is aiming to bridge between scholars and research and the industry in the creation of the content, even before monitoring what's there, but even in the creation of the content. Um, so there's a shared, uh, shared website, shared uh, workshop, etc. But the idea is to bridge between research directly to have a direct uh, interaction with industry people or the content creators. So if anybody's interested, scholars and storytellers, there's a website online. Okay. okay. I have a question to you. I was thinking that <laughs> the development of these platforms and this kind of new application is so fast that it's very hard to evaluate something. The evaluation and all this mm -hmm. stuff takes a lot of time. So maybe when before you publish the evaluation, everything will be old. Well, so this I might think that's a, how you deal with this problem. Okay, I think that's a risk. So our framework at the moment is. Uh, we're, we're pretty close to publishing it, yeah? But we, we're going around the people who've advised us before and saying, is there anything here we've missed? Is there anything here we need to re-emphasize? I think the accelerated pace of artificial intelligence over the last 18 months, it's certainly, it's certainly something that our own decent department of culture completely missed in their green paper. They didn't say a word about it. And the paper was supposed to be about moderation of online content. So I, I think that's a challenge. But I think it's even more of a challenge if this, if this is a self broadly a self-regulatory or co-regulatory initiative. I think it's even more of a challenge if you would like the French and the British and others, you're going to set up a brand new regulator and there will be laws, and those will take several years to come into force, and they have to write codes of practice. I mean, that's much, you know, I've said it's not, that, that process is not future proof in any way. We also have the same problem, but I think we can move faster. A lot faster. Um, my question for David, so I love the fact that you and I could talk much about the eye tracking with. Um, one, one thing I was thinking of was, Will you be capturing other activities that they're doing outside of, of what the phone is collecting? So you were saying like the um uh kind of is the physical activity tracker okay. GPS and the GPS no, um, accelerometer. The accelerometer, isn't it? But not everybody carries a phone around with them when they're walking around. So will, will there be other ways that people can record um, things that they're doing that like they're doing? Like without mobile phones, you mean? Well, we will, uh, such as this, my colleague is using Fitbit and giving them Fitbits, but this would be too expensive and uh, impossible to give to 200 children. And uh, we will use only data from mobile phones. There are also studies comparing uh, this uh, Fitbit, or they have also these accelerometers yeah. here. Mm -hmm. And there are studies comparing results from mobile phones and this stuff. Uh, so we can uh, use some methodology to try to, there is some mistake because you know sometimes they let the mobile phone on the table and mm -hmm. go somewhere, but yeah, we will not use other tracking stuff than only the mobile phone. And we can ask in the questionnaire also, you know, yeah, it's short. They the report, but it's very hard because there are actually three well beings, and the questionnaire can be one, two minutes every day because it's every day. So, how you can ask all, all the stuff, you know? So, that's, this will be challenging if you ask for sleeping or, or sports or psychological well being, how they feel. There are even million scales for psychological well being, body image, you know, and so on. So. Um, so, Julia, could I ask a question to Veronica? How you respond to these other two models you've heard? 
there's a kind of independent moderation of the decisions of content on the one hand from Julia, and there's a machine learning model of understanding and engaging with children's uses. Just interested from a practitioner at the heart of those options. Um, <laughs> 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 um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not the project by Gibson, you see, he, he sent to me a picture of the project two days ago. I said, well, we have to talk about it. But one of the questions I have uh, is the, you're, you're giving the application to, to a number of individuals. How, how are you managing to, to get the compromise? Or how are you thinking of getting the compromise of those individuals in, in the age groups? What, what is your mediator? Are you doing it through schools? Are you doing it through, through research funds or yeah. non governmental organization? Because we, we work, for example, in Spain. Mean, what is the sampling? That, that what is the sampling and how many individuals? You just play it, but how, how do you get them to, to do it? <laughs> there what is, is the motivator? For this bird package, there is 200 for this one year, and uh, they give some, some gifts and so on, but we have money for the research agency to do the sampling. Mm -hmm. So, so we, give, we get addresses from the research agency. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this paper probably will not focus for the representative sample for the no, it, it will be like a convenient one, but it will be uh, it, it will be through a mediator that, that, that get those individuals to, to allow them to get anonymous data, of course, yeah, yeah. but to also put actively participate in the responding. It will be some kind of uh, water sampling similar mm -hmm. to the longitudinal yeah, research. Yeah. You know, they, you should have a contract with the family for the one year. With consent of parents and children, and that's it, give them some uh, money or incentives and gifts. <laughs> okay. Again, question for you, David. So I can't but just think of the concept of surveillance capitalism. There was a book by Shoshana I mean, this is surveillance of children to a really, really deep degree, and the intentions are wonderful, and you can learn a lot about it. But is there a thought about the possibility that this wonderful software we can be used by commercial companies, but else to gather, to extract data from children to a very big degree to, for uses that are not as pure as just learning? I mean, the whole notion of surveillance capitalism. And another thing that just comes to mind, a colleague of Sonia from uh, NSC, uh, Nick Aldrey, just came up with a new book that compares this kind of extraction of data to colonialism. So it's extraction of material, now it's extraction of data. So I'm just thinking of the potential yeah. dangers. I don't know if you, you don't need to answer, I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. we cannot think about what does it mean. Yeah. My answer would be, this is the tool for basic research, and the companies are doing that already now, without your consent. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know. <laughs> So we are we are behind already as researchers yeah. because we need to do it in an ethical way, correctly yeah. from the law perspective. Ooh. But if you talk to people from T-Mobile or O2, they say yes, we already do this kind of processing of our data, and they don't need any consents. It's no ethical commissions. Would they be learning from you? <laughs> from your from your advances because you're going to be uh, creating a much more advanced system potentially. That's that's the question. If you, yeah. I think it's kind of different if you focus. What is your output? Because our output variable is well-being, you know, and we link the stuff to the well-being in some way. And uh, I think it's kind of different because they were with bigger data, millions of customers, let's say, and the machine learning on big data. This will be not so big, but uh, more focused on risks and uh, detection of risks and opportunities. But I must say it's also questionable what 
it's uh, like the feeling which you have is okay we can detect everything what by the machine learning and all the risks will be just automatically you know but it's so complicated i am kind of uh, it is project really on the edge of the current research and we are very happy to be able to do this but uh, just to get some get you some give you some feeling about the machine learning for the coding you you need the data for the coding for the entrance coding then you get the data it's a big problem because you before you have this uh, uh, anonymization you can't work with it so you must use some data which are public for this also kind of hard but you need for the machine learning to start you, know, you need at minimum 1000 of positive occurrence of the thing such as if I want to detect cyberbullying for the first round of annotation I need 1000 of positive occurrence mm -hmm. so imagine how many lines it is uh, it might be all to get 1000 lines of the text to get 1000 positives uh, of aggression on kind of this and you have to code it and this is only first so it is not so simple to say that we will be able to detect everything and it will be perfect and it is yeah. not like this it's really first step and trying to find ways what is possible and what is not possible and yeah so it's more like this thank you well, I was thinking about that problem with privacy, with the, the children's privacy, COVID consents to track, to allow to track all that data. Uh, how it is with the consent? Yes. Uh, I, think, okay. I didn't speak about it so much because it's for a long discussion and we had uh, millions of meetings on that already. But first, I would say that we had consent from parents and individuals on their data but we don't have consent on this other data from third parties, let's say. Uh, first, we divide two texts and photos and the point is that we will not save the photos at all. These photos will be directly sent to the external service to evaluation, so it will be not even stored. We just get information that is what is on the picture. And sure, we, we cannot evaluate uh, because cyberbullying, for example, or aggression can, could be done also through the photos and pictures, but we will be not able to identify this. We just get information on the picture, was food, group of people, group of friends, whatever, this kind of simple information. So we will, we will work only with texts, and the, these texts will go for this uh, process of anonymization, so we should be able to remove all the personal data which are present in this text. So this is the main point. But in the end, like uh, no researcher will have access to this uh, all the texts. You know, we will not work with the texts. The final database will be only coded texts and coded pictures. But it's still uh, so many data because I didn't explain. Uh, these this screens from the mobile phones will probably uh, save every five seconds or maybe dynamically uh, depending on the activity of the children. Uh, but it is also not first project like this. For example, in US there is a big project which is much, much forward, which is entitled uh, I just forgot, screen, Screenomics, Google Screenomics. It's, I think, in Stanford, I think. Mm -hmm. And, uh, by the way, US, uh, in US it is much simpler from the ethical perspective, because in US they say uh, the person who, who saved the screen is owner of the screen, whatever is on the screen. So, they don't have ethical problems at the screen of this. We will be very in touch with them, because saving screen and sending to researchers, there can be anything. Because the person owns the screen, in, even if there are personal data of third parties. But European law is uh, much stricter and, and is much harder, so... Yeah. Okay, yeah. we're, we're running very close to time in the hot room, so I'm going to invite very brief final comments from the speakers. Maybe just to give one 
final comment of my own. Um, I feel I grew up in a world where the people who studied practice were in a different room from the people who studied policy. But listening to this debate, particularly linking it to Sonia's talk this morning, the whole thing is, a, is in part a discussion around governance and the challenge we have to think through the effectivity of different forms of governance from parents through to traditional policy environments in which humans try to influence legal policy outcomes through to machine learning. It, it's a huge challenge and we're a subset of the bigger challenge of contemporary governance in digital worlds, but it's also a very exciting one to try to build those links. So I must say for myself, it's been a tremendously great environment to have those different strands come together. But over to you, some last uh, remarks. Take over. Okay. Um, maybe as, as a conclusion and recommendation, it will be taken also from, from the opinion of some of the panelists, is that I think the research groups in, in our field and in the interdisciplinary field we are going to be working in the future, need it be to be uh, constructed, built by diversity. Diversity in the field of artificial intelligence, big data, technology, social sciences, humanities, and maybe also what Julian uh, was sp speaking to us in, in Madrid, in one lunch, also maybe by, by that, that approximation to the indicator policy. Indicator. Mm -hmm. And uh, you indicate uh, redundant. No, no, I have redundant indication. Mm -hmm. word. Uh, sorry. But my, my, so that will be the first idea, interdisciplinary. And the second short uh, idea in, 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 in the impression is that it's, it's a question and, and a thought. How can we manage if we are the start of researchers and as policy advisors like you are in the Internet Commission? That if a, a metaphorically speaking, if, an, if a nuclear power station deals with uh, dangerous data, the data on uranium, right, and we have supervisors going into those facilities and getting those data, but what they're doing, at least, because it may have effects on the site, if we understand that at least in the target of children and youth, there's a situation of, of opportunities, like Sonia said, kind of danger, what can we do? Should we, can we lobby the policy makers or do something to help the future generations that being formed in a situation that may be risky at this time? The Internet Commission can do that in a, from a European perspective. That's a question and an idea. <risa> ah, bueno, eh, mi humilde opinión, yo trabajo, realmente mi trabajo es trabajo de campo eh, con los niños. I do feel good with children. Um, creo que es muy interesante lo que han propuesto los colegas y se plantea una situación um, de cambio, realmente que sentimos todos. Es a change, change situation, colegas talk about it. Creo que sí es el momento en el que se van a ejercitar las políticas y se van a poder ¿no? introducir los cambios. Is the policy time, is a critical time? Y para mí, después de escuchar ¿no? eh, todo lo que he oído, para mí creo que es muy, muy, muy importante y no nos podemos olvidar del contacto directo uh, eh, con los niños. Realmente hay que incluir toda la tecnología, todo lo que hacemos, cómo medimos. Uh, Technology uh, is important, but we need to have direct contact with children. No, y vuestra investigación con vuestra metodología es muy importante. Las preguntas que hacéis el trabajo de la universidad, de la industria, de las familias y los medios. Well, the traditional standard Juntos. methodology, but technology is important to, sí. to come together media with producers Pero para mí, and, and scientists, of course. Pero para mí, desde mi más humilde opinión, que no estoy en no, el mundo académico, my um, humble opinion, ni de la tecnología que impresiona mucho. Technology <laughs> and discovery. Maybe. <laughs> uh, también, eso sí, también. Eh, trabajo con los niños. Creo que se basa en el trabajo y en la inclusión de los equipos de los niños. Trabajo de campo. Desde lo que acabo de decir, la posición de acompañamiento y la visión del niño. De, 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 the position of uh, helping the, the child and being with the child and having their opinion. Thank you. Super. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. David, 15 okay. seconds. 15 seconds. Oh, I'm just showing you. Then it is uh, 
uh, machine learning is still only a very stupid tool and uh, it's not needed to be afraid of it. <laughs> Artificial intelligence doesn't exist. You gave me just 50 seconds. We saw actually sentences of the biggest expert of the, on the machine learning who is working for Facebook and is Czech. And he's saying like this, it's like best person. Machine learning is in this moment only kind of content analysis combined with statistical methods. It's nothing more. Ah, yeah. <laughs> sure. And it is on the beginning. So. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, I just want to add one point. So we didn't have time in the piece itself. So I didn't talk about the biggest social media companies. And we've had long conversations with them with Google and YouTube and Twitter. And they are polite and friendly and interested, but they have not signed up to our framework, which we're not surprised about. Yeah. Uh, they say you should look at our, trans our own transparency frameworks, which, which they all have. And we say, well, that's great, but you tend to put the stuff in which, is, which you're celebrating, the things that make you look good. You're not putting the things that make you look bad. And it's, you know, you're marking your own homework. And they say, no, no, it's not as bad as that. You know, we are much more transparent. So what we're doing now in London, we're, we're taking one of the uh, transparency frameworks from Twitter, and we're comparing that with our own evaluation framework. Mm -hmm. And we are looking to see where the gaps are. And it won't surprise you to know that there are quite a few gaps. And then we have to work out what we do with that information. Okay. Can we thank speakers? Thank you. Yeah.